Okay. We can get started as people come in. So happy to have uh, Ihab, my good friend, on tonight for us. This is a special treat to have him on here. Kind of reminds me of uh, being back in the in the COVID era, but either way, you know it's it's a nice way to to see some familiar faces online and uh, have a very special topic. We've had Ihab here a number of times already in Toronto on soft tissue management and on bone grafting techniques and implant dentistry. So I'm happy to have Ihab with us here in this next hour to go over regeneration techniques. So Ihab, welcome and uh, happy to have you again. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody that's um, with us today. Uh, I know this is mostly for Canada, but I, <clears throat> but I know that Canadian Implant Dentistry uh, Network uh, group has a lot of uh, international participants as well. So hello to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for uh, this opportunity and this kind invitation to um share uh, a little of my experience with everybody today on this particular topic. And again, this is a very uh, informal type of discussion. You know, it's um, it's Tuesday late evening, everybody's tired from work. Uh, everybody's, you know, laying back, maybe you're enjoying a cocktail or a beer or something like that. So again, I'm gonna keep this informal. And the, the original um, plan for this presentation was to go over something that reviews hard and soft tissue grafting all together. And as much as I like to do that, as much as I like, there is so much in hard and soft tissue grafting that if you give a lecture that is a mere um, outline of how things go in hard and soft tissue grafting, you, you will rarely walk away with anything, in my opinion, because again, this is so, there is so much in there to condense into a 45 minute lecture. <clears throat> so instead I chose to pick a particular topic um, uh, pick a particular particular topic that's something that everybody can apply or something that everybody can walk away with a little something from this lecture to apply in practice. So again, the topic I'm going over today is horizontal bone augmentation, one stage versus two stage approach. And what does it mean? One stage versus two stage approach. Uh, it really in simple terms mean, do you place the implant at the same time as you do the bone graft or not? Do you place your implant at the same time as you do a GBR? Are you placing your implant at the same time you're doing a lateral window? Uh, this is gonna be the topic of discussion today, more related to horizontal bone augmentation. And so um, a little bit about myself first and my background, I am a periodontist uh, from Alexandria, Egypt. This is where I come from. Um, I've been living in the United States for a third of my life now, for about 12 years. And um, I came to the United States to study periodontics at Cleveland, uh, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I did a fellowship and residency there. Absolutely amazing experience. Um, and you can see some photos of Cleveland here. This is on the thesis defense day uh, that you see in the bottom uh, screen. I then moved to New Orleans, Louisiana uh, to get a little bit of training on implant prosthodontics because you spend all that time doing surgery four years. Um, you really lose track of everything restorative. And I feel that that year um, of doing implant prosthodontics and even uh, two supported fixed prosthodontics not only made me a better dentist, but really a better periodontist. And so this is something, you know, if anybody's listening here who's um, you know, in their perio residency or thinking about going that route, I highly recommend uh, this particular program at LSU University. And so um, I did that program for a year. And ever since then, I've been living in New Orleans, Louisiana. This has become my second home. And I've been very fortunate that, you know, I not only get to practice what I do, I am a full-time um, practicing clinician, but I also get to, you know, go through uh, events, online events, such as what we're doing here, where you meet like what minded individuals and you, you share a little bit of your experience and you also learn from other people at the same time. 
Now, if you've never been to Egypt or New Orleans, Louisiana, you're missing out big time. Um, these are some photos from Egypt on the left hand side. Mark is Egyptian originally also, but um, I don't even think he visits uh, Egypt uh, very often. So he, you, you're missing out too, Mark. You know, if you look at the left hand of the screen, these are some of the most beautiful beaches that you'll see in the world. Uh, on the right hand of the screen, these are some images from Louisiana, New Orleans and Louisiana, very famous for the cuisine, um, really the best food in the world uh, from what I've seen. Uh, carnival season, Mardi Gras, if you're into that, to that type of stuff, um, you know, amazing cocktails, amazing cuisine, and just a very unique city uh, compared to the remainder of the United States, in my opinion. And so Mark and I, you know, this this friendship, and um, you know, it's not only it's not only that we do courses together and all that. There, this this comes from a friendship, and uh, I'm very happy to, um, with you know, with having known Mark because we got to know each other through Dental XP, and ever since then, it's been it's been a great one of those great relationships where we just push each other forward. And so again, thank you, Mark, for uh, this kind invitation and for organizing this uh, webinar uh, this evening. Going back to our topic, our topic today is bone augmentation. And bone augmentation, in my opinion, is an interplay of three different things. We're looking at technique, we're looking at diagnostics, and we are looking at material. And it's an interplay of these three main things um, when we're talking about bone grafting. But today I feel that um, our discussion really is falls somewhere in between all three of them because today we're really talking about sequencing, right? And we're talking about how we can take the right diagnostics, choose the right technique and the right material, and then how to put all these steps in order. You know, do we place the implant at the same time? Do we place it later? Do we do the soft tissue grafting first? There's a lot of decision making when it comes to bone grafting. And today we're talking about one of those decisions that's related to sequencing. And again, we're talking about sequencing as you can see here on the screen. Sorry, I flipped one too quick. And again, usually the way we go about managing um, harder soft tissue grafting cases is that you do the bone graft first, you then place the implants, then you do your second stage surgery to put it in very simple terms. But here you see on the screen, this is, you know, this is how much effort it takes and how much surgery it takes to um, regenerate this horizontal defect that you see on the screen. And you'll see that the sequence here is a little bit different because here we actually place the implant at the same time as the bone graft, which was a ridge split, which is a form of horizontal bone augmentation that allows us to place the implant simultaneously and then we went on to perform our soft tissue grafting at a later stage. So how do we go about sequencing those cases that present with hard and soft tissue deficiencies? Well, this is how we normally, or how I normally look at these cases. A case walks in, I know this case needs a bone graft, there's a bone deficiency. First thing I look at is the soft tissue. Do I have soft tissue that is gonna allow me to predictably close my flap over the bone graft that I'm going to do? If I have that kind of soft tissue, which again, it's, it's kind of outside the context of this lecture to get into that. Uh, but if I have those soft tissue conditions, then yes, I will move on to the hard tissue. But let's say I have a very shallow vestibule or a very coronal frenum or um, extremely thin tissue, and I wanna use something like titanium mesh, then in these instances, we may need to perform some, so some sort of soft tissue augmentation procedure first. But anyway, we, whether we perform the soft tissue augmentation or not, now we're ready to perform our heart tissue augmentation. We have good soft tissues that allow us to be, to predictably perform the heart tissue. Now we look at the CT, we perform our heart tissue analysis, and then we choose a particular technique and we go on to the heart tissue augmentation. All goes well, hopefully, with the augmentation. We're waiting four, five, six, even nine months, depending on the case. And then we proceed with the implant placement, implant heals. We do our second stage surgery. Uh, I like to go through a second stage analysis first. And again, second stage is a, is, is a very underrated step. Uh, if you've ever been to one of my uh, soft tissue courses, you'll know how much 
potential we have at second stage surgery to correct the soft tissue, to make sure that uh, we set our implants up for success restoratively, and then we do our second stage surgery. Well, this is the typical sequence, again, of going uh, of doing these cases. And this right here, this is what we call a two-stage heart tissue approach. Well, other times we can look at the deficiency. We can, and this again, this applies mainly to horizontal bone deficiencies. We look at the horizontal bone deficiency and we feel, well, you know what? I think I can place the implant and do the bone graft at the same time. And so here you look at this flow chart. And here we've combined the implant placement and the hard tissue augmentation into a single step. And this is what's called a single stage approach where you're augmenting and placing the implant at the same time. As you see here on the screen, this is a case where we had a patient missing a central incisor. Um, we saw from the CT that we would have a fenestration uh, defect uh, when performing this case. And so we place the implant, we have the fenestration, we know that it's there, we're performing a simultaneous GBR, connective tissue graft, as you see to the far right of the screen, and an immediate implant-supported provisional. And that is one of the, really the key or the, the best parts of uh, placing or doing a single stage approach that you can utilize the implant for a screw-retained immediate provisional which patients obviously love. And for us, it's much less headache than doing any type of provisional. So the outline for today is really pretty simple. We're gonna go through the basics of guided bone regeneration. We're gonna go through the advantages and disadvantages of single stage and two stage augmentations. We're gonna go through some of the indications uh, for each approach. And we're gonna go through a clinical case review at the end to show how we can apply all these principles. So this is a slide that um, as a resident in probably in 2016 or 2015, I saw Maurice Salama um, lecture at the Academy of Aussie Integration and I saw him put up the slide. And till this day, I, um, excuse me. Till this day, I love using the slide because I feel it applies to bone grafting very, very much. And so what are the denominators of success? What are the factors that you have to have in every single bone augmentation procedure so that you're successful? Um, let's go through them. First off is graft stability. If you look to the right hand of your screen, you're going to see here that all bone grafts, all bone augmentations, ridge augmentation procedures, which again, I'm differentiating here between a ridge augmentation or a bone augmentation procedure and a ridge preservation procedure. I am not talking about taking a tooth out and having a four walled socket and placing bone into that uh, into that socket. This is a different um, different from what we're talking about. We're talking about bone augmentation procedures here. And so graft stability, you can see the collagen membrane on the top stabilized by periosteal sutures, the mesh on the bottom stabilized with screws and tacks. The more complex the technique that you'll use when you use the rigid space, uh, rigid barriers uh, like mesh or titanium reinforced, the more important is going to be to use rigid uh, graft stability like screws and tacks to hold down your membrane or your uh, titanium mesh. Second thing is space maintenance. We need to create a space and maintain that space so that the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts can go into that space, resorb the bony particles that we have put in there and lay down vital bone. And this is a process that takes several months and so we need to make sure that we maintain that space so that soft tissue does not invaginate that space. So how do you maintain that space? Well, here we're using a combination of tenting screws and bone graft to support a collagen membrane. If you were using a titanium reinforced membrane or if you were using a titanium mesh, you may not, you may not need the, the tenting screw because you have a rigid barrier that will not collapse under that. Access to regenerative cells. Like I just said, we will need the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts and angiogenesis to invade the site so that we can have bone graft turnover. And whether you are a believer in decorticating bone or not, um, the literature is pretty split when it comes to that, to that topic. There's literature to support and literature to not support. I would say in 90% of the cases, I am not doing any decortications. You can see to the right-hand side, 
dehiscence and fenestration defects and, and extraction. And you see how the bone is bleeding. Bone has its natural decortications, which are aversion canals, um, as I've learned from my good friend Howie Gluckman. And so, again, in most cases, I am not doing any decortications. Barrier occlusiveness and containment. Um, occlusiveness means you need a barrier that will prevent the soft tissue cells, the fibroblasts, from invading into your bone graft. And that is definitely important in the majority of our bone augmentation procedures. But if you look at autogenous bone and people who use Cori technique, and Cori technique, a lot of people do not use an occlusive barrier over the top, and it still works. And so occlusivity, in my opinion, is a function that, that is necessary with, my, with most bone grafts or all bone substitutes, but not so much or not necessarily with autogenous bone. Uh, but again, a topic for another lecture. Other than occlusiveness is containment. Bone graft is like sand. If you put some sand on a table, it's gonna fall everywhere. It's gonna move all around. And so you need to wrap this up with a membrane and you need to secure and stabilize that membrane that this bone graft will not seep mesially or distally and will remain immobilized underneath that membrane. And last but not least is primary closure. And that's important for any type of bone graft that we use. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you put under that flap if you cannot secure the flap properly. And double layer closure is what we're always looking for. And this is another uh, something that we practice at our hands-on um, in our courses um, religiously, because this is really the most important step or one of the most important steps of any type of bone graft procedure. Now we're talking about GBR mostly. And so we're gonna be talking about membranes. And so when we talk about a membrane or a barrier, what are the functions? These are the three functions that we are looking at essentially, which is graft containment, like I just said, if you put bone grafts on a table, it's just going to fly everywhere. You need something to stabilize it and keep it in its spot, right? So that's graft containment. For example, if we're talking about a socket, do you really need graft containment in a socket? A socket is like a hole. You're filling a hole with sand. Does it need to be contained? No, it doesn't because it's already contained by the defect. And so depending on the defect, depending how much graft containment you need and that'll allow you to choose which barrier you want to use. Rigid space maintenance, some of the barriers provide rigid space maintenance like mesh or tie reinforced. These are rigid, will not collapse under soft tissue pre pressure. Lastly is cell occlusiveness and we need, again, when we're using bone substitutes especially, we need to have a membrane that will be occlusive and prevent soft tissue cells from crossing. Um, looking at barriers and breaking them down into different categories, we can break them down into resorbable and non-resorbable, occlusive and non-occlusive. Resorbable are barriers that you don't have to go back in and take out. Most commonly used nowadays are collagen and pericardium. Non-resorbable are barriers that you have to go back and remove. And in general, it is well known that non-resorbable barriers have a higher rate of complications compared to resorbable. And we know for a fact that we re reserve the use of non-resorbable barriers for more challenging defects. And you'll see that um, at our courses as we show how you manage which defect, which type, which type of barrier. And then if we can break them down into occlusive and non-occlusive. Occlusive are barriers that will prevent soft tissue cells from going through, like collagen. And non-occlusive are barriers that will not prevent cells from going through, like titanium mesh, as you see right here, it's got holes or pores that will allow any type of cell to go through. And that makes you think sometimes because, okay, we see people using titanium mesh, not putting a collagen membrane over it, and it works. So why does it work since they don't have occlusive properties? And again, in, in my opinion, bone grafting, it's, it's not... Um, it's not right or wrong. There isn't one way or another way. There, there's always a gray area on how you perform your procedures. But as long as you know how things work and you have the experience, you can be successful using many different techniques. So if we look at the literature to see what it says about using membranes, and this is pretty basic information and that we should all know. And resorbable membranes are associated with less complications. We know that if you have a non-resorbable barrier, 
and it becomes exposed through the soft tissue, then you're likely going to have a big problem, especially if it happens earlier on. We know that with GBR, you, it is beneficial to add bone graft underneath because if you think about it, if you're using a PTFE membrane and you don't put a bone, bone graft underneath or a titanium reinforced PTFE membrane that can stabilize itself with no bone graft underneath and you just have a blood clot, it technically should turn into bone, given the principle of GBR. However, this is more literature and didactic information. We should definitely add bone grafts in all these cases. Um, and so, again, pretty basic information that we have in the literature. Um, in my hands, this is the membrane that I use most in most horizontal bone augmentations. And so, again, I want to give everybody something to walk away with here today. This lecture is not sponsored by anybody. It's not sponsored by uh, OSIX. However, this is the membrane that I use most common in my practice, and that's why I share it with you. It is a uh, cross-link membrane, meaning that it goes through a particular process that allows it to stick around for a longer period of time. <clears throat> and so, in my opinion, if you're doing a larger defect and you're using bone substitute, you want a membrane that will stick around so that the body has time to turn that bone into vital bone. Um, this membrane is not for tacking. Um, it has very low tear strength. So you really want to suture that membrane in place with periosteal sutures. Um, I think it resorbs in about four to six months uh, based on personal experience and re-entering and seeing the membrane. And the good thing about this membrane, what I really like is it's reproducible. It's not something that I'm going to show you and I'll show you excellent results, but guess what? This is a technique that cannot really be applied for most people, you know, because it requires whatever, requires a particular setting, requires a particular set of skills, but this membrane is reproducible. And if you learn the technique and you learn how to perform a proper GBR, you will get good results in horizontal bone augmentation procedures. Handling of the membrane is a little bit difficult at first. Like I said, it has a low tear strength. Um, in my opinion, as with any GBR, you need primary closure over that membrane um, or over any membrane, in my opinion, to get predictable results. What bone graft am I using with that membrane and, and defects? Well, my primary bone grafts are what you see on the screen, allografts and autografts. Autogenous bone, bone that comes from the patient that we are working on. And I'm reserving this for more challenging defects. Obviously, if I'm doing any bone augmentation procedure, I'm gonna be incorporating some sort of autogenous bone. I'm also probably not using any collagen membranes, but for horizontal augmentations, I'm gonna incorporate this in external defects, defects that were grafting outside the contours of the alveolar housing, uh, cases that are severely um, deficient horizontally, and a lot of the times I will incorporate a mix of autogenous and allogeneic bone, maybe 50-50, maybe 70-30. Um, but these are the two types of bone grafts that I mainly use. Harvesting autogenous bone, my, my favorite sites to harvest are the ramus and the tuberosity. And we go over um, uh, all of the procedures or techniques of how to harvest autogenous bone um, in our total tissue training. But again, uh, tuberosity and ramus are very um, safe and minimally invasive sites to harvest from, in my uh, humble opinion. Now let's look at a case. Here's an example of a case where we're performing a um, two-stage approach with an O6 plus membrane. Here you see a defect that this is a, I would say it's a moderate vertical defect and it has obviously horizontal bone deficiency at the same time. Now this patient is not really concerned with gaining all the vertical bone back. He's, it's not a case where we're concerned about um, papillae. It's not a case where we're concerned about um, the length of the teeth. It's, it's an elderly patient that wants to get some teeth to chew with a very low smile line. And so here I'm using a graft less approach as described by Dr. Craig Mish, which, which is I'm trying to gain some bone to place the implant mainly in a horizontal dimension a little bit of the vertical so that we can place this implant, these implants and restore the patient without having to resort to a complex technique like um, titanium mesh or bone blocks or whatnot. So here you see bone allograft in place with a little bit of autogenous bone at the same time. 
You see the membrane strapped down. These are periosteal sutures, and this is the way to secure this particular membrane. These sutures start from the palate, anchor into the periosteum on the labial aspect, and then come back out through the palate. So these sutures are all internal. I see often um, on social media people posting these cases, and their sutures are external. So this suture cannot be crossing over the margin of your flap. It has to be all internal. Uh, um, and so again, this is how to wait, the way to do it. Start from palatal, engage periosteum, come back to palatal and tie it on the palatal aspect. Double layer closure, as always, the most predictable way to close a flap on, uh, around the bone graft. This is how it heals. And then we let this heal for about five to six months. We go back, we have um, satisfactory bone formation in my opinion we didn't re regenerate the entire vertical aspect and this is something that we already knew because we're using collagen membrane but we have enough bone to place two implants and then go ahead and restore this patient with an implant supported bridge and bring him back to function and what about a single staged approach again here's another uh, single staged approach where we're placing the implant and doing the augmentation at the same time and so what are the indications to using um, each one of these approaches? Well, let's talk about the advantages and the disadvantages first. Um, Two-stage approach, advantages, you're decreasing the procedure risk and complexity, right? You're not placing the implant at the same time as the bone graft. You are doing the bone graft first. So even if the bone graft fails, your implant will not fail, right? Your implant will not fail because it's only the bone graft that's in place. Another advantage is, let's say you do a bone augmentation procedure, it heals and you go back in and you're like, you know, I formed some bone, but I don't have enough yet. And so if you formed a little bit of bone, but you've, you haven't regenerated the defect completely, well, when you place the implant, now you still have the option of doing a single stage augmentation or grafting again at the time of the implant placement. Disadvantages, well, it's more surgery higher number of procedures, which usually equates to more cost to the patient. And so I will say it has decreased patient acceptance um, and it has the problem of provisionalization. A lot of times in the anterior zone, if I can perform a single staged approach, I can provisionalize the patient with an implant supported provisional. And that makes things easier for both of us. The patient likes it more, obviously, because it's a temporary that doesn't come in and out. And for me, I don't have to worry about any removable prosthesis sitting over the bone graft and completely ruining it. You cannot have any type of removable prosthesis sitting or applying pressure to an area that you've performed the bone graft because that is a recipe for failure. Now, single staged approach, this advantage is obviously it's decreased treatment duration, decreased number of procedures. In this particular case, as you see on the screen, I'm grafting at the same time, and I'm also using this implant because it has adequate torque to provide an immediate screw-retained provisional. And all this leads to increased patient acceptance, less surgery, less time, less cost, and fixed teeth from the start. What about the disadvantages? There's increased risk. That is for sure. It's not a question. Because you're doing too many things at the same time. That's number one. A lot of times it can be a challenge getting the implant in a correct restoratively driven position and at the same time grafting around it. Decreased regenerative potential. In my opinion, it's a lot harder to grow bone over a titanium surface compared to growing, growing it over a bone surface that provides blood supply. And so definitely there's re the decreased regenerative potential. If you have a failure or an infection of the graft, well now guess what? You're looking at a much bigger complication with graft infection. In a two-staged approach, graft infection, in my opinion, is a much less headache. Here, you're gonna lose the graft, you possibly may lose the implant, and it can possibly lead to, especially if you're using something other than a resorbable barrier, it can lead to disastrous bone and tissue loss on teeth that are neighboring, and then it becomes a much, much, much bigger complication. And so indications, when do you use each of these approaches? In my opinion, you have to first look at the defects. What type of defect are you treating? And first we gotta look at the orientation of the defect. This is the Cologne classification. It's a very nice bone 
Um, defect classification, um, I've modified it a little bit, as you will see towards the end of it. But first thing is defect orientation. Is it vertical or is it horizontal? Obviously, we are only talking about horizontal today. I would not recommend simultaneous bone augmentation or simultaneous vertical bone augmentation and implant placement, except for people who are very, very, very um, skilled and experienced with these types of procedures. And even in my hands, it's not something that, you know, I, I do very often. In my opinion, I find that it's too much of a risk to do um, these types of procedures with vertical bone defects. Second thing is reconstruction needs. How thin is that ridge that you're trying to treat? If you have a ridge that is three to four millimeters wide, well, maybe we can perform a simultaneous bone graft and an implant. But if the ridge you're treating is one or two millimeters, then probably no, probably graft and come back later to place the implant. Relation to the alveolar envelope, and this is a, a point that uh, I would like to stress the importance of is, are you trying to grow bone within the contours of the housing, as you see in the top photo, or are you trying to grow bone outside the contours of the alveolar housing? Outside is more difficult, more challenging, and so I would not, I will rarely attempt placing the implant and grafting bone outside the contours of the alveolar housing at the same time. Last but not least is the span of the augmentation. Are you doing this in a single tooth or are you doing this in a multiple tooth uh, site? And again, these are the parts of this classification. The span of the augmentation is something that I've added. But in my opinion, if you want to perform the single staged approach, here's my cheat sheet on when I would do this. Compliant patient. Patient that knows that we're doing a risky procedure, understands it, and knows that he has to be compliant for this to work, and he wants it to work. Non-contributory medical history, not to be done on smokers, not to be done on patients with high H uh, HbA1c or uncontrolled diabetics. If you're treating an edential site, then I would not do this in a ridge under three to four millimeters, probably four. Fenestration defects, as you see on the screen, in my opinion, are a good indication for this technique. It's easier in my hands to treat a fenestration where you have part of the apical, an apical part of the implant exposed. It's easier to treat that than to treat a dehiscence where the crestal part of the implant is exposed through the bone. Again, defects within the contours of the alveolar housing, as you see on the screen here, these are all defects or sites that I've treated with a simultaneous approach or a single approach. Implant placed and bone graft to be done at the same time. Notice that they all, I'm trying to keep that implant within the alveolar housing, and I'm trying to encase as much as I can of the implant surface within the native bone. It's easier to graft over bone than to graft over an implant surface. Having obviously adequate soft tissue to cover the bone graft um, after all of this is done is also an essential part for the single staged approach. So let's look at some cases that review all these um, principles that we have been talking about. So this is a, uh, a case where we used a classic two staged approach. And this is a patient that had a tooth that is unrestorable. We need to extract it. We have a very thin labial plate of bone with a possible fenestration, and that's why I did not consider a partial extraction therapy procedure here. However, we don't have any apical bone. If, if I had the CT scan here, and I apologize that I don't, apical to where that tooth is, the bone tapers extremely, and so there is really no bone to engage with an immediate implant underneath that socket the bone tapers severely. And so that implant, when we place it, has to be within um, lengthwise. It has to be within the dimensions of the socket because these are the widest dimensions of the ridge. So what we're going to do here is take the tooth out and we're going to perform a simultaneous bone graft approach. This is not a socket graft. Socket graft, we would be only grafting inside the socket. In my opinion, grafting inside the socket here is too much risk because if you lose a little bit of this dimension, then you won't have enough bone to place the implant. So you need to do a onlay graft where we're grafting outside the labial plate of bone. This is an O6 plus membrane with freeze right bone allograft stabilized by periosteal sutures. And again, here, this is not primary closure, but with teeth, 
that we've immediately extracted and we're doing a simultaneous bone augmentation. This is my preferred closure right here, which is getting the flaps within two, maybe three millimeters of each other. In my opinion, this is, this is enough to allow this area to heal predictably without performing extreme flap advancement procedures that will distort the mucogingival junction. And this is something that we spend a lot of time uh, teaching at our courses uh, with Canadian Implant Dentistry. And again, I cannot get into that um, at the moment, but over that collagen membrane, we're putting PRF. This is how we close it. And this is how it looks at five months post-op. And you can see and compare um, the pre and the post-op. You see how we're able to grow bone outside the contours of the alveolar housing. We've moved our labial bone to the level of the canine or maybe past this as well. And then we're able to place our implants um, predictably in a restoratively driven position. We're adding a connective tissue graft. And connective tissue grafts, you really want to add these at the most coronal part of the implant on the buckle. In the anterior zone, if I'm not performing a socket shield or some sort of partial extraction therapy, then I am automatically adding a connective tissue graft, as you see on the screen. We suture everything in place, and this is how the soft tissue looks immediately before provisionalizing. You see we have nice full papillae in place because we added that CTG, and um, this case is ready for restorative. Well, what about a single stage approach? We so showed this case earlier. This patient's missing a central. Study on the CT scan shows that I can get this implant in a screw retained axis position while getting an apical fenestration. And so this is studied based off the CT scan. It is not guided, but it is studied on the CT scan. And this is exactly how we planned it. So we have good bone over the crest of the implant, but the fenestration is at the apical part. We perform immediate provisionalization and you can see the contours of the provisionals and keeping that subgingival portion as thin as possible so that it accommodates the bone and tissue graft. And again, we're doing a GBR to augment the apical aspect of the implant. We're also grafting coronally. And then we're adding a connective tissue graft again those coronal four or five millimeters of the implants on the buckle, this is where you want to have that connective tissue graft. This is where it's gonna give you that nice effect. And this is how we close the site with immediate provisionalization. And again, here, this immediately provisionalizing the case allowed us to be able to shape the soft tissue from the get-go, but also allowed us to not worry or not have the headache of what provisionals this patient got to wear. Is it going to be an Essex that we have to change every few months, or is it going to be um, a, a flipper, which can be disastrous if it puts pressure on the soft tissue? Let's look at another case. This is a patient that comes in missing number 10, and these are really the bread and butter cases where I feel the single stage approach works well. Unfortunately, it's also in the aesthetic zone where stakes are high. And so again, I recommend this procedure for clinicians who have performed this multiple times in other areas of the mouth first. But again, aesthetic zone, implant is placed, and you can see here that the bone, how thin the bone is, but I am doing my best to keep this implant encased within the bone. Now you'll notice that I have a healing abutment on that implant, and this is really a key part of doing these augmentations, which is using a healing abutment or using a tall cover screw as a tent. Because when you don't put that, when you put a cover screw and then you place your membrane over and you close your soft tissue and the soft tissue heals and shrinks and puts pressure, that pressure gets transmitted directly to the platform of the implant. But when you have a healing abutment or a tall cover screw, which tents that pressure and moves it away from the platform, in my opinion, you get more buccal bone formation or um, less buccal bone loss, less loss of your graft when you do that. And so here I'm using a short healing abutment. Bone graft is going all the way to the top of the healing abutment. Um, this is just another slide to show you on the left side, we're using the healing abutment as a tent. On the right-hand side, I'm using a tall cover screw um, from Megagen which again serves the same purpose, but I really do prefer, preserve the cover screw due to its um, narrower uh, dimension. 
Going back to our case, bone grafts in place, stabilizing our bone graft, and we we differentiate in our course the difference with the different type of periosteal stabilizing sutures. These, in my opinion, I call these limiting sutures because it's like you're locking or strapping the mesial and the distal um, extents of that membrane so that these grafts will not seep out. Um, immediate um, post-op here, you see double layer of closure on that site. And then this is how the site heals. And as you let the site heals, you will likely get it, if you put a healing abutment underneath the tissue as a, excuse me, If you put a healing abutment under the tissue, as I did here, you will likely, as the tissue heals, um, get some exposure of that healing abutment. As you see on the left hand of the screen, we're slightly deficient on the soft tissue. And so I'm going to do a little tunnel to insert a connective tissue graft to bulk up the tissues on the site. Like I said earlier, if I'm not using a socket shield, I'm always adding a graft in the aesthetic zone for visualization. And here you see... Um, two weeks after provisional and surgery, and you see that we are starting to develop our soft tissue profile very nicely. Last case that I would like to go through, and this case really is a mix of everything, and it shows us the benefit of utilizing the two-stage approach, in my opinion. This was a case that I did back in, uh, I would have to think it's probably from 2021, I would say this case, and this was two failing central incisors, two partial extractions, two socket shields performed with immediate implant placement. We then perform provisionalization and we go on to, uh, to finalize the case. And here you see the final soft tissue profile before provisionalizing the case back in 2021. Now, or in 2020, I'm not sure. Now about two or three years later, this patient comes back and the right central incisor, there's a deep pocket, there's pus, there's bone loss on the x-ray. We open it up and we see that we have fracture of uh, the implant. And whenever you have a fracture, you're going to have parts that are moving. Whenever you have anything that is mobile or loose or moving close to bone, it will cause bone loss, rest assured. And so this caused bone loss and caused us to lose the socket shield at the same time. And so we start by... Obviously, we need to augment this site first. And you see on the right hand of the screen, we perform a GBR. Looking at this in retrospect, I feel there isn't enough bone under that membrane. I probably should have added more bone under that membrane. Uh, but again, that's in rest retrospect. We're doing a two-staged approach. I'm not placing the implant at the same time. Augmenting. Closure. Then we're waiting about five months here. We go back and now we have some bone formation. But do we have enough? We really don't. We have about three millimeters of ridge width at best. And so because we performed the two-stage augmentation first, now I can go in, place my implant, and I have a second chance, a second chance where I perform a secondary bone augmentation. Now I'm using a tall cover screw, as I've mentioned earlier, and I'm using a collagen membrane, and I'm bulking that bone underneath the membrane. Here you see the limiting sutures really maintaining that graft where it needs to be. I'm going to add a connective tissue graft, and that connective tissue graft is extending from the crest to the slightly beyond the crestolabial line angle. And the crestolabial line angle is really the area where um, this type of graft matters. Um, primary closure. And then when we come back, we're going to use a little apically positioned flap papilla sparing incision so that we move the tissue from the coronal part to the buccal aspect and we place a healing abutment. We then proceed to provisionalize the case. And here you can see the final soft tissue profile of this case. And here you can compare what we started with and how we were able to regenerate the hard and soft tissues that were lost for this particular case. And now to conclude, you know, I know it's a Tuesday night, everybody's probably tired, so I don't want to hold everybody up. To conclude, single stage implant placement and bone grafting is more technique sensitive and risky than two stage grafting. There is no question about this. Earlier today, I myself was doing a procedure where I was placing two implants and performing a lateral window approach. The distal one of those implants had about maybe a millimeter of remaining bone or a millimeter and a half 
of residual bone. And I performed my lateral window, placed the anterior implant, drilled for the posterior implant, placed the implant, placing the cover screw. And as I'm placing the cover screw, well, because there's so little bone, there was so little stability, the implant, uh, I was finishing my surgery. You know, everything was about to be done, but the implant moved into the sinus, went beyond the Schneiderian membrane, had to take a CT, find the implant, take it out. Again, if you're doing a procedure, you have to be prepared for its complications, but single stage to pl implant placement with bone grafting is definitely more risky and technique sensitive. However, it can be a viable and successful option under the correct indications, knowledge, experience, and skill, in my opinion. And this is what the decision depends on. It depends on the patient, the site characteristics, the clinician, and most importantly, clinician skill and expertise. And with that, I would like to um, thank you all very much for tuning in uh, this um, evening. And I would like to invite you to uh, check out our course on May 10th to 12th of 2024 in Toronto, Canada. This is a little QR code that you can use your phone to scan now. And this is a three-day course that is designed to go through everything that is hard and soft tissue augmentation around implants. Um, I think for anybody who wants to start or is doing these types of procedures, this is a great course to um, just get everything together and get everything organized in terms of sequence diagnostics, what materials to use, how do you perform these techniques, and then we do a hands-on where you get to practice techniques like free gingival grafts, connective tissue grafts, GBR with sutures, with stacks, Corey technique. And so again, uh, I look forward to it. It's always a pleasure to be with Canadian Implant Dentistry Network. And I want to thank you all again for tuning in today. Thank you so much, Mark, for organizing this. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Ihab, for uh, hopping in tonight. Hope everyone's doing Great. If you have any questions, always shoot me a text or email. Happy to help. And hope to see some of you in 2024 at our new facility and hosting EHAB back in Toronto. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.